Hey, what's up, y'all? Welcome back to the Stay Human podcast presented by Gibson Guitars. I've been looking forward to this episode for weeks and weeks and weeks. I'm glad that we finally got everybody together in the same virtual space at the same time. And I'm also excited because you may remember a couple months ago, Sara joined me on one of the podcasts and it, it still stands out as one of my favorite in this whole series. So, Sara, say hello to everybody. Hi, everyone. So excited. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to have this conversation. Nice. Let me tell you about our guests today. Guests, plural. Since releasing his first album independently at just age 15, Grammy-nominated singer, songwriter, and producer Sean McConnell now has a robust catalog under his belt, including songs recorded by artists like Little Big Town, Tim McGraw, Martina McBride, Brad Paisley, Rascal Flatts, Brothers Osborne, Christina Aguilera, and me. <laughs> <laughs> Sean earned his first number one single as a writer on the country charts with Brett Young's Mercy in early 2018. And his objective with his most recent album as an artist titled A Horrible, Beautiful Dream is to reflect the chaotic time in which it was made while still striving for timelessness. And Sean's wife, Mary Susan McConnell, is a celebrated author and host of the popular Mama Bear podcast, a space she created for fellow women raising children in profound circumstances. Mm -hmm. So you guys, welcome to the Stay Human podcast today. Thank you. It's an honor, really. Hey, Mary Susan, I want to start with you. Because, you know, as I mentioned before, you're we talking about how we're we're a family, Sarah and I, in, in this music business. And a lot of times we're not exactly in the same place at the same time. Um, there's moments when I've, I'm out on tour somewhere and we're communicating by FaceTime. And then there's some situation at home. Sorry, me, you might want to jump on this. There might be some crazy thing. I want to know where you're going with it first before I jump That's happening in. with Taj. And she's just like at the end of her rope, she calls me. She's like, what do you, you know, what do you got for me? And I'm just trying to be like the best listener I can. And usually my advice falls completely <laughs> inadequate. Just describe to me what it's like for you, like in this exact moment right now, wherever you are in your kitchen and, and Sean's out on the road somewhere. Well, in this exact moment, I am in my kitchen. I have my laptop here in case school emails me for our daughter. Our daughter has profound cerebral palsy. So her story is a, is unique in the fact that I always need to be within a five to 10 minute drive of school in case we have something come up like a seizure or something like that. Now she's rocking it. She's doing great. I have no concerns. She's loving life. But to answer your question, when Sean's on the road, for me personally, it does mean things like that, where I have to either be very close to home or arrange for someone to kind of be there and step in. And that said, that's one of the reasons why I'm so passionate for women like myself and men, all caregivers who are trying to figure it out and figure out how to have a really beautiful and fulfilling life out with this very unique role of parenting and outside of that. So prior to this call, I was doing a podcast. And then prior to that, I was painting. I love to paint for just my own therapy and uh, the farm helps a lot and we love life. And, and so does my daughter. But so when Sean's out of town, it's great. And yes, we've had those calls of like, I haven't slept in 48 hours. I'm going to lose. I'm, I'm just going to cry for a moment. <laughs> and that's fine. <laughs> and how, how Sean, how do you show up being on the road for Mary Susan when she's having those ones. Cause I know I've sent Michael like text messages where I'm like, dude, when you come home, you are on, I am out. Like I am done, you know? And, and I always have to think about when I'm sending that text message too, because sometimes it's not great to send that text message right before he goes on stage or right before he's going into a writing session, because you don't want that to be the forefront on what's on his mind. So how, how do you guys hold that's space nice for each of other? You to consider me. I mean, that's that a way. new thing. I have to say it took a little bit of therapy and some self work to figure that out. It took a couple of years, but I feel like the last two years I've gotten that better. Oh, yeah, you're really good at that. <laughs> yeah. Better at it than I am for sure. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that we, there's a lot of similarities there. Cause Mary Susan is, is really 
conscious of that about timing. You know, if if we if if it's a situation where there's the luxury of actually caring about the timing of it. But I, Michael, something you said earlier really made me feel the exact. I feel the exact same way as where it's like when you're not there, really all you can do is be a good listener. And uh, I feel like, and Mary Susan, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but when you said that, like most of the, your actual suggestions just are just kind of fall, like they're not going to actually think they just, you know, it's just, I'm with you. I try to just be present in the moment and like hear what's going on. Sometimes I can intervene. Like if AB's upset, sometimes I can like make her laugh with like some different sounds or like, being silly and like that can help on on a actual level but i feel like most of it is just like an acknowledgement of yeah your gig is i would consider even harder than my gig and uh you're doing awesome and i'm sure that you're like losing your mind right now and and just listening to where mary susan's at in those moments i want to talk to both of you about you, you, how you came to be the people that you are and just your early childhood. Mary Susan, where did you grow up and what was your family like? What did your folks do for a living? Do you have brothers and sisters? I have an amazing sister. She came into my life when I was 15. And so I was, for the majority of my childhood, raised as an only child. I love it because I lived in the city with my dad in Nashville in a condo. And I lived on a farm with my mom in middle Tennessee. So I kind of had both, both experiences and, um, with rural and being in just straight in the center of Nashville. And I, I loved that. And I brought that kind of into my adulthood now. So I love, we live on a farm, but I didn't want to be terribly isolated. So we are directly across the street from a neighborhood. So while we can have pigs and chickens and in our whole life, we can also cross the street and be with friends and walk into town. And I love that for our daughter specifically, because with with her, she speaks in a variety of ways and words is not one of them. And so some of the things that I may not be aware of, or like who exactly her friends are at school or things like that. And so for us to just be able to hop in her jogger and cross the street and kids run out and start talking to her, it's a really beautiful way for me to experience her community. So I kind of took my childhood from that to where we are now. And um, as far as locations, I I think early on when I was a kid, I just was very interested in adoption. And that was really my only thought growing up as far as parenting. And so it's not a surprise to me that our life looks kind of the way it does right now. Mm -hmm. So your sister came into your life when you were 15. Tell me about that. Yeah, my dad, my, both my parents remarried. And, and when I was 15, my father had, um, my sister with my amazing stepmom, and she's just incredible. She's she lives in New York City, and she's just the best. And and it was a really fun way to experience having a sibling being so much older. But now, now that we're both adults, it, it that kind of gap. It's not like a fifteen year old and an infant. It's very much like two adults having fun. Yeah, that's great. What what was it like? Just you know, being fifteen years old and. Your parents are living in different places. And, and then was school something that was cool for you? Was it a challenge for you? You know, I'm just trying to imagine what it's like to be that age. And then suddenly, hey, we're having a, <laughs> another kid, another sister's coming into my, my life. Like, what was what was life like for you up until that point? My parents did a great job of, I, I feel very much raised by the both of them. My dad, he lived in Chicago for a season of my childhood, but he would come home every single weekend to pick me up from school. And I'd spend the weekend with him in Nashville. So I was always in the same school. I, for my childhood and my, the, the experience felt very normal to me because that was really all I knew. So I just went from the farm to the city, the farm to city, but the same school every day. And, and then when my sister came into my life, It was, you know, it was, it was around the time where I too was growing. I was becoming a teenager and I had my driver's license and I could go places. And so it was like a transition kind of, of her coming into the world and me having more independence than I had prior. So I don't know, it was a, it was a unique way to grow up, but it felt exciting. It felt fun. 
Sean, what was it like for you growing up? I'm a one of four kids. I was uh, born and raised in Massachusetts. Our parents were musicians and my dad was a songwriter. So we were raised from a really, I mean, as far as I can remember with, uh, you know, going to my parents' shows, like they'd play uh, coffee houses or bars or churches or, you know, wherever, wherever there's, there was and me and my siblings would be there and kind of side stage watching our parents play music and on the weekends like they would have their band come over and rehearse or they'd be writing and it was just kind of all hours of the night music and it, it was just really it was a real magical way to grow up and we're all super close like me and my siblings and it's just uh yeah it was a we were homeschooled after a certain age and so we were all just doing life real close for five or six years and i think that formed like a really special bond with each other and with our mom that we still have to this day and yeah it was just a it's a pretty amazing way to grow up the way that we did with a lot did all of you guys play instruments did all the Um, kids play instruments so my little brother he plays some guitar my younger sister maddie she plays guitar as well and and they both sing and my older sister sings but she doesn't play any instruments everyone loves singing and that's kind of holidays there's always some sort of guitar pull song situation going on it's a big part of who you are and my parents they played music growing up in the catholic church that we went to when i was really young and yeah it's just all music is it's just part of who we are it's a real strong part of who we are was there sibling rivalry when you're a kid you know you got four four kids in the same house i grew up in a situation we had five kids in the same house and we were there was there was never a moment where there wasn't someone's hair being pulled there wasn't someone putting paprika in someone's ice cream dish there was like you know it's just like non-stop was your house like that or oh yeah it was definitely many years of mayhem a lot of uh I remember one time distinctly my sister threw the, the top of a pan at my at me during a fight and uh things like this were not uncommon in our our household there was uh <laughs> <laughs> especially being homeschooled it was just like you just start getting cabin fever it's it just things get pretty nutty but we all got it out of our system pretty young <laughs> You were a kid growing up and playing all this music in your house. Your parents are doing music. And was there times when your folks went away? Did they ever go on tour like how your life is today? Or was it just local things? No, it was local. Yeah, they never were going on tour. I mean, we were sometimes like my grandparents would watch us. They had like a a weekend gig somewhere like a, you know, a Friday, Saturday every night situation at like a bar or something, but no, it was never a touring. They were never gone. I mean, uh, there might've been a couple of vacations they went on, but that wasn't part of our, our story. Yeah. At what point did songwriting become a thing for you? Or did you, did you have a band, did your family band, did you start a band with friends? When, when did it start to become like, man, this is something I think, is more than just I'm going to do with my family at home. So before we moved to Georgia, when we were still in Massachusetts, I started playing guitar and my mom had this old, she still has this old uh, 70s Yamaha. And I remember very distinctly like learning a couple of chords on when I was 10, 11 years old. And I started writing at the same time as I started playing, like it was kind of the same instrument like songwriting and the guitar were the thing to me so i started really doing that and then when my dad was at work i would sneak in and pull his really nice guitar from under his bed which i wasn't supposed to be playing and i would play that and uh i would just i would say by the time i was 12 or 13 like i was already going to talent shows or like open mics that i could do and like my mom would get me in to like these bars that I was too young to actually be walking into to play open mics in Atlanta. (laughs) 
which is super fun. And then, I mean, I started playing uh, just because I saw my parents do it. I was just like, oh, so you, you bring a PA somewhere and you just play and you tell your friends you're going to be there. So, I mean, by the time I was 14 years old, that's what I was doing. I got this old PA system that my buddies gave me for a birthday. Like they all just pitched in some money and I would just go play just at, you know, walk into like a Buffalo Wild Wings and be like, Hey, can I play here tonight? They'd be like, sure. And I'll set up the base PA system. And, and then I just never stopped. It just kind of started like that. And then it just kept growing and growing. Wow. That's, that's awesome. That's really cool. Mary Susan, what was, what role did music play in your life growing up? I love growing up in Nashville. So my, you know, my, my parents were every, everybody in Nashville that I knew we were just constantly kind of going to shows, but my uncle is a well-known harmonica player, Jelly Roll Johnson. And so he, he was always playing the bluebird like once a week. And so I got to go to that whenever I felt like it. And it was such a gift to hear these songwriters and see that whole world. And so by the time that I met Sean at 19 years old. His journey of being a professional musician just totally made sense to me. Like nothing about that was surprising. And and with, you know, the first time that I saw him play, it was because a friend of mine was like, you got to go see this guy. You got to go see this guy. He's in our class. So you got to go see him. And when I went to go see him, I was just so blown away. And it was fun to introduce him to my family because everybody was just so used to this Nashville music scene. I'm super curious about how you guys decided to adopt. And I kind of want to like jump up to that real first and then, and then backtrack into your guys' lives a little more to understand the people that you are that made you. Cause first of all, even to think about adoption is, is challenging. Like most people don't even think about it. It's, it's like, I'm going to grow up and I'm going to have a baby and, you know, get married and all this stuff. And then people who do think about it think, well, I want this really cute kid who's just perfect in every way. And I want it on the day that I need it in my life that works for me. And, but you guys adopted a child that's like you described Mary Susan, this is like a every minute of the day commitment. And and so I want to learn more about that, about like what led you guys to that. And, and, and first of all, why don't you just describe how you came to adopt Ivy? The question about adoption, when I was, it's interesting because how you said how people think, well, when I grow up, I'm going to have a baby and I'm going to do this. I never had that. I, I would always watch my friends play house and like play that they were having a baby and I was bored out of my mind. Like, I was like, please, God, can we go ride horses? Can we go do something else? And then one night when I was about 10, I had a dream that I was holding this child. She, I knew that there was this maternal bond. Like I felt the bond, but I knew she was adopted. And, and I woke up and was like, oh my gosh, that's the motherhood. That's the experience that I want. Like that's, that feels like home to me. And so I, from then on, as a kid growing up, then when my friends would play house, I could have this narrative in my mind that made sense and that I was excited about. It just, it just stayed there. So when I was a teenager, I would picture myself adopting and and I, I never even pictured myself married. Like when I met Sean, it was like, oh my gosh. I, I, I want to marry you. I was so surprised because I never like pictured myself getting married like that. And especially so young, but when I did meet him, I said, Hey, you know, like, this is kind of my idea. How do you feel about adopting? And he was very excited about it as well. So we got married so young tw- at 20 that we were maybe 25, 26, 27. When we started to think about, okay, do we want to have children and, and how do we want that to go? And we just decided, let's go let's start the adoption process. That was something we had always talked about. And that was the route that we wanted to go first. And that is kind of what set us on the journey to what eventually became this kind of like unbelievably almost mystical experience that led us to our, to our daughter. Wow. Sean, you want to talk about that? How it 
kind of came to be? I can't remember why, but I do remember specifically, I had been out on a tour and I had been like feeling like this is the time that we're going to like, I'm going to come home and be like, Hey, I think that like, this might be the time. And independently she was having those same thoughts. And so I came home and we, we talked about it. And we're like, Oh my God, we were both feeling this way. And so that was like the first time we were like, Holy shit, we're actually going to like call and figure out like an agency. And like, this is becoming real. Like with every day that we do one more piece of paperwork. And so it kind of all gets jumbled in my head, but when we decided to adopt, we wanted to bring someone into our home that might, that would have a harder chance. That's when we, we would talk about domestic, it was either just like super healthy babies that were probably, probably just going to be adopted very easily or kids that were a lot older and we felt young and not ready for that. Uh, for, to, you know, being 25 and then, you know, adopting like a 12 or 15 year old child just felt like it our it wasn't the moment for that that's what led us to a lot of people are like well what how did you end up adopting internationally versus domestically and yeah. that's what led us to international and then through that like i had a friend who had just adopted from ghana and they had like a great recommendation for an agency and a and an agent we were just trying to find people in and places that we because you know that's kind of a minefield out there. The international adoption yeah. um, can be a, a tricky, you know, a tricky thing to figure out. But then, Mary Susan, maybe you can pick up on when AB entered the scene. Yeah, we we were on a list, like a waiting list for a match, and we had said that we were open to multiple kids. A, a variety of circumstances, but it wasn't terribly, oh, it wasn't terribly specific. And then we were waiting and our long story short, our state site coordinator had gone over there and taken a ton of pictures of, of the country and uploaded them to a private account that we were all as parents allowed to look at. And we got to a section or I got to a section of this album that I knew it wasn't, it certainly wasn't, I knew nothing about these kids. Like there was no <laughs> description, but when this one child's face came across the screen, it was just like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, who is this child? Like I have this connection. And, and then it was a month or so after that, because I didn't know anything about, it was not, it was an album, 700 pictures. Like a lot of these pictures had nothing to do with anything related to adoption. But I knew I felt connected to this one specific child. And it was a month or so later in the middle of the night, I woke up and I opened up my, I couldn't sleep. And I went to the living room and I opened up our coordinator's blog and she, it was a public blog. And so it was just a picture of, of eyes, these eyes. And I knew that those were the eyes of that child I'd seen. And it said, we're looking for a home for this child. She likely had, we think she has cerebral palsy. We won't know. No one's going to know until there's a family advocating on their behalf. There's a lot of mystery involved here with her health. And I just like, I, it was like a lightning bolt hit me. Like I just, it was electric. And I woke up Sean and I, I really felt strongly that if this was to be, he would be having the same experiences. So it wasn't I, there wasn't a moment of like, hey, we've got to do this, or, or how do you feel? Like, do you want to adopt a specific child? It was just introducing him to this experience I was having. And it was maybe six weeks later that he was like, okay, I'm having all the same experiences in different ways with the same child. And we knew that this just, it, again, it was that feeling of home. And so I contacted uh, the coordinator and we met with so many people here in town who are raising kids with disabilities. We had Vanderbilt Children's on our side to just ask questions. And um, we flew out there three weeks later just to meet her, knowing we couldn't go to court or any, anything close to that. Um, but we wanted to meet her and and not only just to hold her and know her, but to have as much time as possible to prepare for what this life would look like. And, and so um, it was December of, oh gosh, 2011 that we flew out to, to meet her. 
And how old was she at that time? At that time, they thought she was around a year. I want to just pick up what you said earlier, Sean, like you were thinking that you knew that you guys wanted to adopt a child that might not otherwise be able to find a home. Why? That's a huge undertaking. Why, why was that important to, to both of you guys actually? No, that's a hard question to answer. Just like anything else we operate from, like our litmus test for any decision we make is like, does it feel hot or does it feel cold? Like, what is your soul telling you to do? Like, what is what feels exciting and what feels dead? Those types of like compasses. And I think that the it wasn't, it also wasn't, I'll say like, it wasn't like, this is our mission. Like, because that sounds like a thing that we were trying to do. It was just like, It was part of our heart and part of our conversation with, and it just kind of always was. It wasn't even something that I don't think we really talked about a lot. Like it has to be this or this. It just, I don't know. I don't know when, when or how that happened. It just, I think it was just something that was in us that we wanted. I don't know if that was like a really vague answer. (laughs) No, it's it's, it's the right answer. It's your answer. How about you, Mary Susan? Yeah, I think it's the, it's the same. It was like some pulling. It was just like a pull towards, it, it's like what Sean said, there was no, we're on a mission to do any, no, it was just, okay, we feel like we're ready to have children and, and what does that look like? And and I think it was just this constant pull towards towards her. And, and when we got there and, and we held her, it was like, yes, okay. You know, like it, it just, it, it's hard to describe. What also really stood out for me, Mary Susan, is when you spoke about the community that you tapped into, that you reached out to specifically before you guys took the next step, which I think is really special and very mature of you and such a like very forward thinking. And how how was that for you? Like, were you quickly embraced in and did you find the comforts that you needed to or the knowledge that you needed to before you took the trip? Yes, we were very embraced. And we, what I really appreciated was everyone was like, this is really hard. (laughs) Like, this is going to be very hard. And no one sugarcoated it. I mean, from the doctors to our friends to everyone I spoke to, it was, it was good. It was so good for everyone to be so honest. You know, it, it, for me, it was a gift that, that I could walk into a situation and think, you know, most likely this child's going to need a feeding tube. Let me go ahead and research that. So when the doctor, when we're stateside and the doctor comes in and sits me down and it's like, okay, we think I'm like, I know. And and I'm, I, I've been wanting this child to have a feeding tube for a year because I'm worried about her aspirating. So it was such a great gift to have those people. And, and, and simultaneously it was, you know, like the night she had her first seizure and we're in an ambulance and these kinds of moments I had people that I could be texting and and say like, what did you do when you had this, you know, how was that? And so to have a community that you're, it's like you immediately get rid of all the fluff. (laughs) You're immediately down to the real core of your heart. And like, I'm, I'm scared shitless here. Like my kids had a seizure for four hours and I don't know what to do. And how do you live life after this? And, and how do you, you know, and, and, and some parent is going, okay, I'm with you. I get it. Let's go. I promise you it's going to be okay. And so it, it's a beautiful community to be a part of because there is such little, no one, it's just immediately a very real connection. Yeah. That gave me goosebumps. Wouldn't it be incredible if every community you had was like that? You just got past the BS and you just went right to the real stuff and right to the like core of what I want to get to. Yeah. What was it like? You go over to, to Ghana, I presume you get on a plane, you're flying back. Did you ever have this moment like, what do we do now? And now like suddenly we're parents, A, but now we've also got this kid who is, there's so many more things that need to happen than just change a diaper and, and feed, you know? So did you have that kind of like, whoa, what are we doing moment? I, I remember the, the- one moment like that was the first trip we took when we took the flight, you know, through the night, not knowing anything and showing up. And we had 
our agency had arranged for someone to pick us up and bring us to our hotel because we had a day and a night before we could go meet Amy. And I remember the moment being we got into the hotel room. So like you go through the craziness of the airport and like somewhat of a language barrier. I mean, there's a lot of English going on, but there's also a lot about, you know, and then you're you're driving through all these different terrains and communities and like really intense scenarios happening outside of your window and like the the mayhem of all your internal emotions like holy shit what is going on and i just remember closing the hotel door and dropping our bags and looking at each other and literally saying like what the hell are we doing here <laughs> <laughs> and just, and after they dropped us off, it was just like, we're just a couple of 20 year olds in Ghana about to meet there. It was like, this is, we are crazy. Like, this is insane. And then we did get to meet her. This will probably jump back and forth a lot. That, that trip was a thing, a week and a half or so. And they would bring her out to us at the orphanage. Like we couldn't go in, but they would bring her out and we would spend time with her, which was another just crazy moment, obviously to meet her which we'll probably get back to, but this, another memory I have of the holy shit, what is happening is on the second trip where we did end up adopting her, they, we had her in the hotel with us. And so all of a sudden we're waking up at six in the morning with a baby in between us under this mosquito net and her mouth starts clicking. Like I'm hungry. And I was like, I have to find food for this kid. <laughs> and like, she's having my mouth. Like, what are we supposed to do right now? And there wasn't anybody there to be like, oh, she needs this. So like we paid, like I, I called somebody, I paid a taxi driver to go into a market and like get porridge and bring it back. And we fed her by mouth. And it was just like, all of a sudden, like, I just remember waking up and being like, there's three of us in this bed. This is like, game on like this is real real life happening right now so mary susan tell me about that experience you, you john you you talked about it a little bit but what was it like when you first saw her what, what happened when she first came into the office we we had asked permission are we allowed to take a picture of that moment and they said we could so they brought her, she was in this beautiful white dress bundled up in a white sheet. They brought her to me. I mean, she was tiny, 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 tiny. They put her in my arms and I was just taking her in. I mean, I just can't even, I, I, I remember the, the, I remember the smell of it and all the senses and she was just so warm and, and, and calm. And, um, and I remember Sean snapped a picture and he said, you're going to like that. And it wasn't until we got back to the hotel that I looked at the picture and she's smiling. And when I realized she was smiling in my arms, it was like, that was my prayer was just always like, may this child be happy. And, and, and for her to be happy enough in my arms to smile was just overwhelming to me. And it's, it's like the best memory ever. And, and then of course we traded and Sean got to hold her and, and that meeting was pretty, pretty brief, but it was, I mean, it was unbelievable. It was unbelievable. You know, when you saw that first smile and, and then as the, you know, days, weeks went by after you adopted her, when did you start to feel like we're communicating? And that's to both of you guys. Honestly, I feel like the communication I don't mean this in a way that uh, that shoes away like the actual language barrier or, the, you know, her not speaking. I mean, at this point, she wouldn't have been anyways because she was a year old. But I feel like we have been communicating with her like in our hearts and in our souls like already and that she was reciprocating that, which I think to a lot of people would sound a little silly. But I really believe that. And I think that it really started our own like the, the the language that we still have which it's you know even as even as she became verbal not with words but with sounds underneath that there is just a language of energy and 
I feel like when she was put in Mary Susan's arms and we got that picture of her smiling, that was a, sorry, I just had to cancel a call. That was, you know, such an example of that. Like there was already this back and forth love energy that was happening. That really is the basis of our little family and how we kind of communicate and talk. But then there was things like finding places on her head that she liked to be scratched. I remember like very specifically and seeing her smile and laugh. And we were talking to her about like her puppies she had at home that we can't wait for her to meet. And she would like giggle or smile. And that's kind of like somewhat bigger answer, but that's the beginning of it for me. That's kind of where it starts. Do you guys feel like, uh, but I know both of you are, are, are very musical, obviously, you know, but do you feel like your, your abilities as a musical listener, as a music maker has helped you in your communication with her? That it's not just about verbal language, but it is about sound. It's about feel. It's about touch. Absolutely. I mean, music, one of the most amazing gifts that we found is that music is probably the number one thing that calms A.B. down when she's really upset. She really connects strongly with music and she has very uh, she's very opinionated about what she likes and what she doesn't like. But yeah, I mean, I think definitely like by just on a, like a vibrational level, like what you're saying, like it's not all words. It's the way things vibrate and sound and feel. And she's super tapped into that. And music is a huge, obviously a huge part of our family, but also a huge part of AB's, AB's life and, and what helps be happy. Sean, when you adopted her, what point were you at in your career? Were you working as a songwriter were you doing your solo stuff and let's kind of pick back up on that a little bit i've always kind of done i would say the past 14 15 years i've always done both the seasons kind of tend to dictate what i'm focusing more on but at that time um i was on the road because the last trip i would that we took the two trips the second trip we adopted her but there was still a bunch of visa stuff to go through and we were still waiting so we had to come home and then go back to get her and on that third trip i was not able to go because i was on the road so i was touring and making a record and writing songs uh this is i don't know five or six records ago probably so i was still um yeah i was touring really heavily actually at the time of the adoption actually the the day we got home from the second trip when we adopted her, I we literally parked in my van. My band was waiting for me, and I got in the van and went and toured for two weeks, which was like really difficult for both of us, especially for Mary Susan, um, me having to leave at that time. So it was right in the middle of a, a pretty heavy touring year for me. That was that was when you when we came on the second trip from court. She wasn't home yet. Right. Right. Yeah. And had you been writing for other artists at this time? Yeah, that's something that happened pretty much right after we got married. It's when I started writing. So this would have been 17 years ago or so. Got a publishing deal with Warner Chapel, which I wasn't looking for. It, it just kind of fell in our laps and it became like a huge part of what I've done now for the past 17 years. But yeah, I would have been at that time writing when I'm not on the road, like go, actually going into like Warner Chapel and doing co-writes and writing pretty much every day I wasn't on the road or most days. Yeah, I find just hearing you talk about the story of you like getting out from the airport, having this really intense, heavy trip, emotional, and then getting in the van and being going out on the road. I just, I like a part of me just makes me like, it breaks my heart at the same time. And then I'm like, yes, I can totally empathize with how Mary Susan, you may have felt in that moment where you just like me and there's so many beautiful fruits that come from the lives that we live. And then there's so many challenging moments that like nobody else would be able to comprehend and understand unless you've had those experiences. So I want to hear like 
what what inspired this podcast mary susan or like you i know you were saying that like having like me having a partner who's a musician was shell shock to my family you were either an engineer or a doctor or a nurse it was like you're marrying a musician what you know like, how, does, how does that even work but like what sort of inspiration came from you now having this like life like full-time having a partner who tours and is here and gone and sometimes mm -hmm. being a single parent at home you know essentially mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was the podcast the fruit of that or tell me about that? I, it was really important to me. Sean was the one that noticed early on about, I guess, AB was now uh, two or three and he started to notice like, hey, what are you wanting to do? Like you had all these that, you know, like you are so in the daily grind. Like I want to make sure he's always said like this. I always want you to feel like whatever your dream is, is equally as important as my music career. So like, let's figure out how that works out. And at the time when Amy came home, I was in the middle of my doctorate for, I, I used to be a middle school teacher. It was for curriculum. And I put that on hold because I was like, whoa, I've got to figure out how to be a mom and, and essentially a nurse. And, and I realized when she went back to preschool, when she started preschool, which was 12 hours a week, oh my gosh, maybe I could actually do this thing. But I wasn't interested in curriculum anymore. So I switched to special education and uh, focusing on adults, because that was the part that I really had a hard time picturing was when A.B. is an adult and she doesn't have these resources like school, what happens? And so I focused on that. And through that, I was doing some moment where I was speaking about this or something. And Sean saw me speak and I had secretly been thinking, oh, man, I wish I could have a podcast where people who I, I had the beautiful gift of having friends in real life who are also raising kids with G tubes and who also have similar experiences and, and know the whole world of, of parenting in a way that's not necessarily typical. And so I always thought, man, I wish I could bring those conversations to something where people could hear it in a casual way, because everything is so formal. You know, it's like, you're talking to a specialist, you're talking to a doctor, you're talking to a therapist, you're talking. And, and what had helped me so much was, just my girlfriends. And so I mentioned to Sean one day after I had done that speaking gig, man, I would love to do a podcast in like 10 years and just bring people on the show to just chat about life. And he was like, 10 years. He was like, we have a studio. Like we can make this happen. Uh, and so he said, I'm going to set you up. I had this little closet space at the time. And he was like, I'm going to set you up with a studio before I leave tomorrow morning. And so he set me up with a studio and I just started playing around with it. And when I, I hit record, I just had a lot of fun and put it out and was like, I don't know if anybody's going to want to listen to this and immediately started to get some feedback where people felt like, oh, thank God, someone like I can feel seen and heard and it's real conversations and and it's honest and not just informative, but fun, hopefully, too. And so that's kind of where the podcast started was because I, I know those moments of being in a hospital room or awake at 2 a.m. and like nobody in, on the planet could possibly understand what I'm dealing with right now. And then I find a podcast that someone's speaking and they're, they get it and it makes me feel so much better. So that was my hope. And, and that's what I've been doing for the last few years. And I love it. That's so awesome. And so needed. I worked as a nurse for 10 years, a bedside nurse. And so I can't imagine how you feel as a parent because you can never get away from it. You're being a caregiver for hours a day. But I understand all the challenges and the technical requirements of caring for G-tubes and feeding tubes and, and all of those kind of things. So that's really cool. It's really cool that you went ahead and you had the courage to do that. And I know that there's many more families that'll fall with listening ears onto that podcast and get so much out of so thanks for doing that. Sean, when you make music, I know, you know, we talked about mission before and, and you, you, your adoption wasn't really like a mission perhaps, but as a musician, do you feel a sense of purpose in the songs that you write and, and what do you want to communicate to the world or what, what are you hoping to, to bring to people through what you do as a musician? Something that I've been realizing, I don't know if you feel this way, but like when you're in it, I'm not really thinking about like, what do I want to convey? I'm just selfishly writing to work through something, you know, in hopes that people will connect with it. 
And then I look back on it and I'm like, oh, like that record kind of felt like this was a something I was struggling with or and I've been it's funny because I was kind of laughing the other night. I'm making on this. I'm, up, I'm on a tour right now opening up for another band. And I was making my set list every night. And when you only have like 40 minutes, you're like putting in all the songs that you really feel like are important for people to hear. And I was like, there is some sort of theme that I always want to, that I'm trying to convey these days. And it, which is like, what's the word I would use? I can't get away from like the, um, how important it is. At least I can speak for myself to unlearn so much about like, the uh the dogma and the baggage that can come with like whatever background of like faith or belief or just any sort of baggage you've been handed it doesn't even have to be religious but just like we all walk around with these these things that weigh us down from like seeing what i would consider to be like true love that exists everywhere and in everybody and in everything i've had like a pretty intense journey with unlearning a lot of stuff in the past 10, 15 years. And it's just, I'm laughing. What the, the set list I'm talking about, as I looked down, it was like all these songs, there's like, they're just full of that. And I just never really thought that that was like, I've never consciously been like, I just need to talk so much about this, but I think it just kind of like poured out of, pours out of me because it's something that is important to me. And I just want, when I'm on stage, like I want people to feel liberated to like, question things and to like trust their experience as one of the main teachers for themselves. And I think that's really important. And it's something that I've come to know as an adult, but struggled a lot with before that, because there's a lot of, you know, a lot of people out there, they'll say, don't, don't trust your experience because it'll lie to you. You know, you need to trust this because it's black and white and it's, it'll keep you where you need to be. So I don't know when I'm singing, I want people to just feel the freedom to like feel dangerously open to like whatever they feel is, is true. Like, I hope that some of my music makes people feel that way. And also not to be afraid to enter into the dark parts of yourself that you need to, you know, explore and, and get out. Take a look at, look into the shadows you know, right now is at this time, and we, we've talked about this when we were working together in the studio recently, just like how there's so much division in the world right now. And there's so much there's so much of that dogma that you described on the political spectrum and the religious spectrum and just in everyday life. And it's it puts a lot of pressure on it. And especially in this social media age, I don't know how much your daughter engages in social media, but as a parent, do you think about that? Like, what is this world that my kid is growing up into right now? And how, how can we enable our children to feel whole and, and strong and happy and good about themselves in this world? That's always trying to tell them you got to look a certain way. You got to be a certain way. And, you know, I know as a kid who's growing up adopted in a, in a white family, as this Brown kid, I never felt like I fit in, you know, I never felt like I belonged anywhere. And I really had to like, look at that for myself as I grew up and try to find it for my myself because I didn't see it around me. You know, so as a parent, how do you kind of na navigate all of that with, with your daughter? We're, we're constantly trying to make sure that AB feels celebrated for her very, for, for everything about her while also honoring that there are parts of her world that might be difficult. I'm sure it's so hard when she's upset and I cannot figure out what is wrong. You know, like that is so hard. And with the social media and with, with her life in general, we're, we're trying to always make sure she feels seen and that she feels like she sees other people that have her similar experiences. And I think that that's so important. And, and the truth of the social media piece is we don't have the same experience that other parents have in regards to how is my child going to operate with this? Because at least not right now, we don't have that experience right now because we are 
facilitating her if she wants to watch a video or listen to music. I mean, we're facilitating every button and everything. She can hit, like last night, she was, while I got dinner together, she was playing a keyboard with her shoulder, you know? So she she can do that and have a great time. But the social media aspect is very interesting because I've thought many times, I'm so glad that my when I was growing up that I did not have access to some of the things that are available. <laughs> I don't know, Sean, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, that's just different for us. And probably for listeners, uh, we've probably touched on it from here or there, but for that to make more sense, like she's, AB is nonverbal. She's in a wheelchair. She she doesn't have, at least in now, like the dexterity to hold up an iPad and like touch where she would want to go or like type in a website. So that's like not a thing for us, which is interesting because we're kind of in charge of everything that she sees um, other than, you know, being at school and, and what they teach her there. But the other part about fit, like what you said, Michael, about, you know, being a, being in a white family and how that must've felt or having friends, you know, that look like you or that have similar backgrounds Those are all things that we, it's interesting because we keep those in mind and we try to facilitate that. And also because of as much as we can know how she's feeling and thinking because we know her well, we know her sound. One of the toughest parts about being a parent of someone who's nonverbal is that just like we all had a million thoughts going through our heads when we were 10 years old, she does too. And we can only guess at them and do our best to like comfort her or answer questions that she's probably asking in her mind. So it's, that's the hardest thing. And like what Mary Susan said, like on a typical day, which by the way, I also want to make sure that we paint the picture that AB is one of the happiest kids I've ever met in my entire life. She laughs most of the day in a good season. She has a hilarious sense of humor, cognitively, at least with every child is different in on that spectrum, but she is very much like of her age cognitively. So, you know, we read books and tell jokes and watch shows that line up with where she is. So she's a super happy child, which doesn't mean that there's not really intense seasons where something is really going wrong. And when that happens, just looking, yes, looking left for yes and right for no can only answer so many things, obviously when you're going through something emotionally or physically or medically. So with AB, that's the hardest part. And I'm sure that as frustrating, as frustrating as it is for us as parents, it's gotta be 10,000 times as frustrating for her to be sitting there being like, I'm feeling and thinking all these things and I can't, I can't express them, you know? So that makes that whole topic kind of twice as hard. So we just do our best to take time to sit in her shoes and be like, I wonder what she would think or want to know about this. Sorry, do you have any other questions? I'm going to get to the very final question. Here, I, but... I'm ready for that one. Actually, I'm, I'm like ready to hear. Okay. I, I've, there's been so <laughs> many powerful things that you guys have shared that I can't even imagine. What... Yeah. This is the final question that we, that we ask everybody who comes on the show, which is what does it mean to you to stay human? Like, what does it mean to be human? And then how do you stay that way? How do you hold on to it? Sure. I would say for me to be able to live in the mystery, in the uncertainty, I feel that the da- the danger place, the dangerous places are when you are certain that you know everything, you know all the answers. So for me to stay human is to embrace the the grand loving mystery. <laughs> Now, Sean, now you got to say something <laughs> equally as awesome as that. <laughs> I'll guarantee you that won't happen. So lower your expectations. <laughs> I was actually thinking about this today because I know you asked your guests that question. And I was like, I don't know what I would say. But the thing that I kind of came back to was as humans, we obviously are extremely fallible and like having great, like, cultivating grace for ourselves and not 
making every mistake we make like the end of the world just knowing that most of us can like go to bed thinking like we did our best or at least i tell myself that like you might have messed this up you could have done that better maybe but in the moment you did what you thought you could and so i think staying human is giving yourself the grace to be like human to to be human and to not to to just know that we're never going to get it all right and that we're just doing our best, whether that's our marriage or our kids or our careers, that we're all learning. You know, we're all on the same path in a way. I dig it. That was also an awesome answer. You, you, you guys are both awesome. <laughs> I think they relate to each other yeah. so profoundly. Maybe you guys should get married or something. <laughs> Hey, uh, I just want to just close by by sort of just, I guess, uh, saying thank you to you guys for being such an inspiration. And I know you guys are very humble and would never, you know, say this about yourself, but I consider you guys to be heroic people. And what I mean by that is that you are people who I look to as an inspiration for people who are just doing really good things in the world that I, man, I wish I had part of what you guys have to be so committed to being so dedicated to being so connected to listening to following your heart and to be able to follow through not only as parents to a child that is very unique, very challenging situation, but also to be able to support each other in doing your own mm -hmm. art and following your own dreams, you know, and Sara and I, you can maybe pick up on that, but we go through that a lot to, together too. Like, you know, I'm just trying to find the time for Sara to do what she loves and me to do what I love and be a parent. And yeah, and it's not an easy road. And, and we feel that you guys are both holding space for each other and yeah, I think every single decision that you guys have made through your whole life is inspiring. And AV is one part of that story. So thanks for who you guys are. And thanks for having me on the podcast. It's been such a pleasure getting to know you guys. And I look forward to meeting you guys in person one day soon, too, and meeting AV, too. I know we need to whenever it works out, you guys always have a house in Nashville. We would love to meet Sarah and Taj in person. And thank you guys as well. Not to, I'm not just throwing a compliment back at you, but you guys really put so much light and love out into the world that's so necessary. And your authenticity is so infectious. And uh, all the time I've got to spend with you in the studio, Michael, and Sara seeing you online and what all all of your own you know dreams and things that you work on and 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 Taj and it's just it's good it's the stuff that every that we all need to be seeing and you guys put it out there day after day after day and it, it makes a big difference it really does it really really does it has made a profound impact on our lives and just the last year I mean everything you put on talk about social media everything that y'all do it energizes me personally so and I know it does Sean too so thank you so much Right well, on, whatever guys. you guys need, online, offline, whatever, we're here for you guys. We're like your family, so whatever you need. And if you ever need to just do like medical talk too, I'm here for you too. Oh, I love that. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so much. Hey, uh, everybody listening, thank you so much for being here on this week's episode of the Stay Human Podcast. As always, we want to say a big thank you, a big shout out to Gibson Guitars for sponsoring the show. If you ever want to see a fine array of Gibsons, just go to Sean's studio. <laughs> He's got some nice guitars there um, that are played with love. And we want to say thank you to Sean and Mary Susan McConnell for being on this week's episode and A.V. for being a big part of this broadcast for this week. Until next week, thank you for being here and remember to stay human. Peace, y'all.